All right, we'll get going here. Welcome everybody uh, to our main research pays off. We're going to have uh, Barry Pay and Ray Poniquist will be talking about the critical factors affecting asphalt concrete durable durability in a couple of minutes. Uh, before that, I'd like to give a brief update on some NRA update uh, items. An update on our pooled fund status. We're currently still at six state members. We are now up to 31 associate members. Uh, we seem to be adding associates, a couple of them on a weekly basis, so that's uh, increasing. Just a reminder, our NRA conference and workshop is scheduled for next week. Our workshop will be up at Albertville on the 23rd, a week from today, uh, followed by a tour and a picnic at our Min Road facility later in the afternoon. Uh, the conference is scheduled for the following day on May 4th at the U of M St. Paul campus. Currently we've got about 150 people registered for uh, those two days and hopefully we'll see uh, all of you next week. As far as our NRRA construction, we had our letting on April 28th. We had three bidders. They were all very close on their, uh, on their bids. Unfortunately, these bids came in at 25% over our uh, our STIP estimate of 2.5 million. We did uh, we did manage to get additional funds from our department management to cover those extra uh, expenses. So we're moving towards uh, award, and the low bidder was uh, CS Macross. So we're waiting for that award. Uh, we're hopeful that the uh, the pre-con meeting. Uh, can be scheduled. I think we're shooting for next week and uh, tentatively targeting start of construction in early June. Uh, yesterday there was an NRRA executive committee meeting. They've, uh, the work teams have been focused now after they, they worked on the plans for construction. Their focus over the last couple months has been on long-term research ideas. The four working teams submitted 10 long-term research proposals. Uh, we've made uh, recommendations to uh, executive committee on how to outsource those. Uh, the total estimate for those 10 projects was around 1.2 million in total. Um, we would be using a combination of our master university and trap program, some RFPs to the master university, some direct selects and then a number of uh, direct selects under our TRAP program, which is made up of uh, consultants. The executive committee approved nine of those 10 yesterday, and uh, so uh, you, you should be hearing more information about those coming out soon. And just a reminder before we uh, throw it over to Barry to uh, introduce our subject, um, please mute your phone so we can uh, get a good recording on this. And uh, with that, Barry uh, and Ray, I'll, I'll throw it over to you guys. All right, uh, just to give you guys a little background, this is Barry Pay, Wisconsin DOT Chief Materials Engineer. Um, the Wisconsin Highway Research Program is a program that we've had here at WISDOT for probably 15 plus years now. And the goal of it really is to focus research that's directed towards implementation and direct application to our construction program. It's got four different areas looking at flexible pavements, rigid pavements, geotechnical, and structures. And that program funds about $800,000 to $1 million of research for the Wisconsin DOT every year. The study that we're looking at here that Ray will start off with and I'll follow up on was looking at how we could improve asphalt durability. And it was a really good project for us. I know Ray's been talking about it quite a bit around the country because it really did show how some simple changes and simple modifications to how we do business can really have some positive impacts to the durability of our asphalt pavements. And with that, I'll let uh, Ray take the first presentation. All right. Okay. Thank you, Barry. Uh, it's, it's nice to uh, have the opportunity to talk a little bit more about this project that we did for the Wisconsin Highway Research Program. Uh, the, you know, the title of the project was Critical Factors Affecting Asphalt Concrete Durability, 
and it's WHRP project 0092-14-06. At the end of the presentation, I have a link to the final report that that we put together for it. Uh, So this this project is completed at this point, and uh, we've been talking about it a little bit, as Barry said, because I uh, I think it turned out well. Okay, so the outline of what I'm going to try to go over here today is I'll talk a little bit about the objective of the project, and when I talk about that, I'll really emphasize, you know, the efforts that were done by uh, the department to make sure that that these types of projects are uh, successful. Uh, The second thing I'll talk a little bit about is what do we mean by asphalt concrete durability. Uh, Then I'll go into what we did in the project, the approach. Uh, the major findings, and then, you know, how I think and uh, hopefully Barry thinks we can apply this, this, the results from this in, in practice. So the, you know, the, one of the most important parts, I think, of this project and, and really probably how the Wisconsin Highway Research Program works uh, is that, you know, the uh, work is, is overseen by a oversight committee uh, and, you know, there's always a very clear objective. We've done a couple of these projects at this point. And so I took these directly out of the RFP, uh, you know, where it's very clear to us as researchers what we're supposed to do. Uh, that You know, the objective is to apply the findings from this investigation to support uh, revisions to the specifications and associated guidance documents. So it's not really an academic exercise. You know, the idea here is to produce some results that are usable, and and I hope you'll see in the end that that I think we accomplished that. Uh, The second part of it, uh, you know, I think that's important is it's quite focused. Uh, You know, as we'll go through this uh, presentation on durability, uh, you know, there are many things that affect durability, but we were specifically asked, Uh, to look at how material properties, the properties of asphalt mixtures, uh, affect durability rather than construction practices. So, uh, you know, what we had was a clear objective that was very focused, and and I think we we delivered something that I hope the department finds useful. So, going into the presentation, what is asphalt concrete durability? Uh, The best definition that I could find came from this transport uh, uh, road note 42, this is from the uh, TRL over in England, uh, that, you know, durability is the ability of compacted asphalt concrete uh, to maintain its structural integrity throughout its expected service life when exposed to damaging effects of environment and traffic. And so I think, you know, this is pretty much a, a very all-encompassing uh, definition of durability uh, but, you know, I think what we're really looking at is, is you know, how the environment and how traffic uh, affect the integrity, the structural integrity uh, of the asphalt mixture. So the kinds of, of durability distresses that, that I think we most often associate or distresses we associate with durability are, are things like raveling and cracking of the pavement, uh, also stripping of the asphalt mixture. Uh, in this particular project, what we really considered was uh, raveling and cracking. You know, primarily uh, the things that we looked at were the, the potential for a mixture to crack uh, using some uh, testing at intermediate temperatures. And then the raveling we addressed through the potential for the mixture to, to age. Okay, so the couple of things that we really looked at in the end uh, were aging and uh, cracking resistance, and those are the ones that, that we had, uh, they would be tied to these uh, distresses that you see here. Okay, the, the approach that, that we went through, uh, the project included a fairly extensive uh, synthesis of current research on asphalt mixed durability. Uh, it also included a laboratory experiment where we looked at uh, the effect of, of compositional factors, mixed compositional factors on the, the resistance to cracking and aging. Uh, and then as part of the project, we actually went through an analysis of the specifications uh, of WISDOT specifications using uh, the, the models that, that we developed from the experimental work that we did. And 
so I'll you know go through each of these in a little bit more detail. Uh, the synthesis of current research, uh, we actually were able to get this published uh, as part of this circular uh, that was done uh, at TRB on enhancing durability of asphalt pavements. Uh, so if you go into that circular, you'll find uh, a topic that, that I addressed in that circular that, that was the findings from the current, from the synthesis of research. And in doing this, uh, you know, we found a number of things affect durability, environment, drainage, construction, and mixture composition. And there on the slide, you can see some of the specific factors that, that would be considered in each one. Uh, again, because our, our project was quite focused, uh, what we did in the end is we concentrated, as we were asked, on the mixture composition factors that, that affect durability. Okay, and, and in the end, uh, if you go through that uh, circular, the, the things that are in there that various uh, departments have tried, highway agencies have tried for improving durability are listed here. And these are the ones that we looked at in our laboratory experiment. So one way is to increase the effective volume of binder. I think there's a lot of research out there that will tell you that, that mixes that are higher in effective binder content uh, tend to be more durable. Uh, some states actually use polymer modification to improve durability of surface mixtures and require polymer modification in surface mixtures. Another thing that can be done, particularly when you're using recycled binders, uh, is to use a softer grade of binder with the recycle. Uh, another thing that can be done is to place limits on the, the binder effectiveness or how effective the recycled binder is. And the experiment that we put together, we looked at, at these uh, four factors in, in a laboratory experiment. Okay, and I'll, I'll go through that laboratory, the design of that laboratory experiment now. Uh, you know, these are the four factors essentially that I had on the, on the previous page. Uh, one of the things was to look at the uh, effective volume of binder. Uh, and in our experimental design, we wanted to look at these at, at three different levels. And so the, the most appropriate way or the easiest way I could see to, to change the effective volume of binder was to actually change the uh, nominal maximum aggregate size. So uh, the way we got low effective binder content was to use a 19 millimeter mix. Uh, for the middle one, we used the typical 12 and a half millimeter surface uh, that's used in Wisconsin. And then for high effective binder content, we used a nine and a half. And if you follow the typical design, uh, what you would be doing is increasing effective binder uh, content by volume by about 1% for each of those steps. For recycle content, we looked at three different levels. Uh, the low level would be virgin mixes, so we had some virgin mixes uh, in our experiment, and, and these were all laboratory produced uh, mixes based on uh, current production that, that is being done in Wisconsin. So we had a couple of, uh, we had some virgin mixes uh, for the middle level, which would be the typical mixture that's produced, we looked at wrap content somewhere in the, let's say, uh, 12 to 18, maybe as high as 20% range. Uh, for the high level, what we did with wrap, for the high level, what we did is we included wrap plus re recycled asphalt shingles, uh, you know, to get up to somewhere around 30 plus percent of the binder being replaced in those. For the low temperature grades, we looked at minus 22, minus 28, and minus 34. Uh, again, the idea with this experiment is to design it around typical practice, which would kind of be that, that middle, middle value of uh, minus 28. Then what uh, the other thing that we looked at was polymer modification, where we ha had <clears throat> neat binders and then binders that would classify as V and E grades. Uh, under the MSCR type grading system. And so for uh, all of these mixes, we wanted to look at two aging conditions. So we looked at short-term uh, aging for four hours at 135C, and then we looked at long-term aging, which was the short-term aging plus uh, 120 hours at 85 degrees C, where this uh, 
all this conditioning was done on loose mixes, uh, and then the specimens were prepared. So if you go through this, this complete design, uh, what you kind of have is uh, if you do a full factorial, you have three level or you have uh, three different levels, four different factors. Uh, so that's three to the fourth power. Uh, and then we have two aging conditions, which is going to be short and long term. So in the end, that would result in about 162 tests. Uh, you know, this was well beyond the budget that was available. Uh, for doing the project, so what was done was to produce a factorial design, a partial factorial design. Uh, it's very interesting if you go into the process improvement literature, you find some very efficient designs for doing this. Uh, you know, if somebody is making a product and they have multiple uh, things that they can change, they don't want to do a, a complete factorial, you do some type of partial factorial. And, you know, if we look at producing asphalt as a process, then uh, applying this process improvement uh, designs makes a lot of sense. Uh, these partial factorials, you can look at nonlinear effects, you can look at interaction effects, and in the particular one that we use, uh, you would run 27 tests at two aging conditions for a total of 54 tests. And this gives you an idea of what the pa partial factorial looked like. Uh, what I'm showing here is a box where there would be two factors. Uh, let's say on the x-axis we would have VBE, uh, and then up on the y-axis we would have recycle content. And, you know, to visualize this, all you do is you test at the middle of the sides of the box uh, and then at the middle of the box, and, and you repeat the one at the middle of the box a few times to, to get testing error. Uh, and in the end, what we ended up with are, are nine binders and nine aggregates uh, to fill out this partial factorial design. Okay, the, the testing that we did, uh, what we used for uh, cracking resistance was we used a modified version of the Illinois SCB test, the IFIT. Uh, the modification that we did was we ran the test at 15 degrees C and a slow rate of loading, 0.05 millimeters per minute, uh, rather than using the 25 degrees C and the very uh, rapid uh, rate of, uh, of loading that is used in the, in the current IFIT method. And, you know, for those of you who are not completely familiar with this uh, modified SCB, uh, the parameter that you get out of it uh, is the flexibility index. Uh, which is the energy under the load displacement curve divided by the slope of this post-peak portion out here. Uh, for the aging part of what we did, we also looked at a stiffness index, uh, which was the slope at 50% of the peak load. Uh, and from that stiffness index, we then went ahead and you could calculate an aging index for the specimens conditioned long-term aged and then short-term aged. So the, the two parameters that we looked at were flexibility index for cracking and the aging index down here uh, from, the, from the, the stiffness index for, for aging. Okay, and, and this is, just gives you an idea of the, of the types of correlation uh, that Professor Alcotti is, is showing, uh, you know, for the flexibility index relative to uh, load-associated cracking performance. Uh, what's shown here are the various sections at the at the ALF uh, with the relationship that he's finding between the flexibility index and the cycles to failure. And and all I want to show here is that there there does seem to be a, a fairly direct and linear relationship between the flexibility index uh, and the the number of cycles to failure or pavement life. And and I'll use this as we get later on in the presentation to you know, kind of uh, put things into perspective uh, when we start using the results from this, or I show you that information. Okay, the, the binders that we used in the experiment, we used nine different binders. Uh, so we had, uh, you know, 64 minus 22, we had 58 minus 28, and then we had uh, either 52 or 58 minus 34, uh, where, you know, we were looking to uh, vary the properties of the binder 
uh, by polymer modification to get, get some of the uh, polymer modification effects in there. So at each of these grade levels, we have a, a, a virgin or a, a binder that is non-modified, a neat binder, uh, and then we have two levels of modification. And so what you can see there in, in the chart is the uh, continuous grades uh, that we had for these various binders. Uh, and then, you know, next to that, you can see the information over here on the non-recoverable uh, compliance. Uh, as well as the percent recovery. And in the end, with respect to the polymer modification, we used these recovery values uh, as the uh, indicator of the amount of modification. As the recovery increases, uh, the amount of modification uh, increases as, as you do that. Okay, with respect to mixtures, we use nine different mixtures. Uh, those nine different mixtures uh, came from uh, sources that are currently being used in Wisconsin uh, with mixed designs that are currently being used in Wisconsin with the exception of these two, the Virgin 9.5 and 12.5. And uh, there, there were not uh, current designs of that type that were being used. Uh, so what we did is we made slight modifications to some very low wrap content mixes uh, that had been accepted by the department. And so what you can see over here are the, um, uh, what I've put over here are the, is the volume of effective binder. And you can see that we had quite a range in the volume of effective binder. Uh, also over here I'm showing the wrap uh, binder ratio. This would be the percentage of the uh, proportion of the binder replaced by wrap, and then I'm um, also showing that for the recycled asphalt shingles. Okay, and the, these are all fine grade, finely fine graded mixes uh, that are typically used, used in Wisconsin. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is, is go through the results of the, the laboratory experiment uh, and show you the effect of the various uh, properties that we looked at, the, the factors that we looked at, and show it to you in this type of a graph uh, where <clears throat> I'm going to show you the, the flexibility index information as the bars. Uh, and we've got two different types of bars. We've got the short-term aged flexibility index, and then the long-term aged flexibility index is the dark ones. Short-term aged is the, the light ones. Uh, and then plotted here also is the aging index, uh, is plotted just as these triangles with a line through it uh, to give you an idea of how the aging index or how aging is varying as a function of these various properties. So the first thing you see here is that the flexibility index is clearly uh, highly de related to the uh, amount of effective binder in the mixture, that as you increase the amount of effective binder, uh, you're seeing an increase, an improvement in the flexibility index. You can also see that aging has a significant effect on the flexibility index, that the flexibility indices after long-term aging are about half of what they were, uh, you know, for the, the, the short-term age condition. The interesting thing is that the effective volume of binder within the mixture seems to have very limited effect on the amount of aging that we see. And, and to a certain degree, this seems to be uh, in contrast to what some other people have reported. But keep in mind that the, the uh, values that we're looking at for effective binder content, you know, ranging from 9 to about 12, is, is not really that large. In some of these other projects, the effective binder contents were extremely low on the order of 5%, and they went to extremely high values of like 15. But I think these are more typical of what we see in practice. And so what that's saying is there, there's limited effect of increasing binder volume on the aging characteristics. If you look at the effect of the virgin binder grade, and down here at the bottom I've simply plotted this as a function of the average value for the, the tests within each of those blocks. Uh, what you have is the minus 36 uh, binders clearly have, or the minus 34 binders, clear, which, which had true grades around minus 36, uh, 
clearly have higher flexibility index, and as you go to the 28s, it goes down. You go to the 22s, it, it goes down further. Again, you see this uh, effect of aging in there. This time, however, you do see a little bit of an effect of uh, the binder virgin grade on the aging characteristics where this aging index is somewhat higher for the softer grade of binder for the, the minus 34s. Okay, the next one is the effect of the recycle content. <laughs> and as you move from left to right in the, in the graph, you're getting more and more recycled material in there. Uh, again, you see a decrease in the flexibility index uh, as you increase the amount of recycle. You also see that the virgin mixes tend to have a higher aging index compared to the recycled mixes. And, uh, you know, I think that makes sense that there's, uh, you know, uh, the, the more recycled binder that has already been aged that's in there, uh, there's less of an opportunity to, to see more, more aging. Okay, and then the final one is the effect of polymer modification. Uh, as you increase the effect of, as you increase the amount of polymer modification, you improve the flexibility index or, or uh, cracking resistance. Uh, the real interesting thing here is, is in most everything we did, all of the effects were fairly close to linear with the exception of the polymer modification where uh, in order to get a significant increase from the polymer modification, you really have to get up into this zone over here where you have a high percentage of, of recovery. Okay, and, the, and it, it also seems that the polymer modification has minimal effect on, on this aging index. Okay, so what, what we did is, uh, you know, in order to, to, to make all of this uh, information, to put it into some manner that we could use it, uh, we simply developed a regression equation uh, for the data using, you know, the factors that we included in the experiment, and those are factors that can be controlled in specifications and can be controlled by contractors during production. Uh, we included those in a uh, simple, uh, for the most part, linear with the exception of this last term on the square of the percent recovery, uh, a very simple equation that you can estimate the short-term flexibility index from the effective binder volume here, the low temperature grade of the virgin binder, the effective, what we call the effective wrap binder ratio, uh, where we uh, tried to take into account the higher stiffening effect that you get of the RAS materials over here, uh, and then finally the uh, recovery or the amount of polymer modification that's in it. And I think this, this is the kind of equation you know, that can be used to, to look at specifications. It can be used to look at, at what effects occur uh, if we make changes in specifications or if we make changes in production. Uh, when you develop one of these uh, regression equations, it's really important to see how significant it is from a statistical standpoint. Uh, these p-values here are an indicator of the uh, important, not the importance, they're, they're an indicator of whether the uh, term is significant stif statistically where lower values uh, show a higher degree of significance. And so based on this table here, what you can see is that all of these terms uh, are significant. The standardized partial regression coefficients over here, uh, they give you an idea of the importance of each of the variables. So if you take a look at this, the two most important variables, and they're approximately the same, are the effective binder content by volume and the low temperature grade of the virgin binder. Remember, most of these mixes had uh, recycle in them. The next thing that's uh, in terms of importance becomes the effective wrap binder ratio, the amount of recycle. Uh, and then the last one, the least important, uh, which is somewhat surprising to many people, uh, is the percent recovery uh, that we're getting from the polymer modification. Okay, so to give you an idea of how well this predicts the uh, measured values, what I've got here is a plot of the 
measured flexibility index versus the estimated values from the equation. Uh, that's all of the data from the experiment plotted on there. Uh, another thing is that, that there is a very good relationship between the short-term flexibility index and the long-term flexibility index. And I think this is important because what it tells you is that whatever you do to improve uh, the short-term uh, flexibility index also improves the long-term one, uh, suggesting that, that, you know, maybe we don't have to look at long-term aging, uh, you know, when we're going through using this in some mixture design type process. Okay, so now the next thing uh, I want to go over, and we're getting close to the end here now, is the applications. How do you use it? I mean, what can it be used for? Uh, how, how would somebody use this? So the first application that I have is to look at various factor effects. So what you can do is, is you can take the equation, uh, you can take a given value of VBE, low temperature grade, recycle content, and modification, uh, and you can solve for the flexibility index and, and get an idea of what's happening uh, as I change these various parameters. And one of the things that, that I, I picked just to, to look at, you can look at nominal maximum aggregate size, you can look at a number of different types of effect, but I, I thought this was a very interesting one uh, where many uh, agencies, I think right now, are going toward higher amounts of recycled binder uh, without making a change in the grade, low temperature grade of the binder. In fact, some of the states that we work with over here by, by our office are allowing the uh, recycle binder ratio to go up to 30% before making a change uh, in the binder grade. And so all I've done here is solved that uh, equation for the flexibility index using a VBE of 10 and a half, a typical, let's say 12 and a half millimeter mixture with a low temperature grade of minus 28, increasing recycle contents, and what you see is a decrease uh, in the flexibility index. If you use that linear relationship I showed you earlier from Professor Alcotti's work with the, with the ALF, uh, basically it's, it really tells you that the life is essentially the ratio of the flexibility indices. So you're getting down to, you know, lives based on the, the flexibility index of as low as 53%. Uh, what was originally put in AASHTO M323 when Becky McDaniel and Mike Anderson did the, the recycle study was to make a change in the low temperature grade when you exceeded 15% binder replacement. And so all I've done here is solve the same equation uh, doing that and it, it shows you the effect. So your minus 28, once you get above the 15%, you would drop to a minus 34. And what you can see is that that has the effect of bringing everything back up to where it was originally. So the point here, and, and like I said, you know, what, what we're seeing uh, is that in many cases, people are using 25%, let's say, as the cutoff. Uh, if you don't make the change, you're looking at 90% or 61% uh, of the life. If you do make the change, uh, you're back up at, at 97. So I think, you know, the, the, there is some, I, I think that, that what we found, uh, you know, is supported by some of this earlier work that was done on recycle uh, that, that made some recommendations that we now seem to be relaxing as we go forward. Uh, a second application that you can use it for uh, is you can select the flexibility index you want. And, and that would be the cracking resistance that you would like. Uh, and then you solve for the various combinations of the factors that give you an equal flexibility index. Uh, and what that does is it actually yields a specification uh, that gives you a mixture with specific cracking resistance. Okay, and, and this is the example design specification that we put together in the project for the southern portion of, of uh, Wisconsin, where normally a 58 minus 28 binder is uh, specified. And so what you have here on in this left-hand column 
is ever increasing amounts of recycled binder being placed into the mixture. Uh, a previous study that was done for Wisconsin showed that once you get above about 30% recycle, uh, the low temperature grade controls and, and you're going to be forced at that point to drop to a, a, a 58 minus 34. Okay, so this part of the specification, you, you can't actually get there. Uh, then what you see across the top here are different grades of binders. So this is an unmodified binder with a minus 28 with increasing amounts of modification. Then an unmodified binder uh, at a minus 34 with increasing amounts of, of modification. And, and so what you can see is as you increase the uh, recycle content, what you have to do to balance, you have to do something to balance the reduction in cracking resistance you're getting. Uh, that either can come from polymer modification, a change in the grade of the binder, or by increasing the effective binder content by volume. So if you want to run a 30% uh, wrap mixture uh, without changing the grade of the binder and using a neat binder, then what we should be targeting is a higher about 2.2% higher VBE than what we do for a virgin mixture, where we've got the 10%. And the 10% here would be uh, the, you know, the current minimum designed VBE for 12.5 millimeter mixtures uh, that, that's in the Ashto M323. Okay, and, and so, you know, if you use a, a modified binder, then you can include, you know, you can continue that uh, you know, the use of the lower VBE up to a higher percentage of recycle. And, and so this type of a specification, I think this is a, a way that this information can be put together in a specification uh, for people in practice. Okay? So the, the, I'm going to wrap up here and, and kind of summarize the major conclusions. Uh, what we found in the study was, one, that the resistance to aging was not significantly affected by the mixture composition, uh, you know, to a, within the range that we would normally build in practice. Uh, the second thing we saw is that the cracking resistance, as measured by the flexibility index, is significantly affected. Uh, it improves with increasing VBE. It improves with decreasing low temperature grade of the binder. It improves with decreasing amounts of recycled binder. Uh, and then it improves with increasing amounts of recovery uh, where you're doing this modification and, and adding polymer to the binder. Some other major conclusions are that uh, improving the resistance to uh, cracking for short-term aging uh, also improved that for long-term aging. Uh, here I have to add a little caveat in here that the binders that we saw had normal aging characteristics. Uh, we're not seeing binders, let's say the minus 34 binders, did not contain some type of softening additive that uh, aged in a, in a different manner than what we have uh, traditionally seen uh, with, with neat binders. So, uh, you know, if, <clears throat> if something is added to the binder that ages differently, then maybe this, uh, <clears throat> this conclusion would not be valid. The other thing I think that came out of this is, is if you use some type of statistical design like this uh, from the process improvement literature, I, I think you can get, re, you know, useful regression equations that either an agency can use to set specifications like we did in that last example, or a producer could use this same uh, approach to design mixtures to meet a specific performance test requirement. Uh, I think that would reduce the amount of, uh, let's say, trial and error iterative work that a producer might do. Okay, and so that, that's all I have. Uh, this is my contact information up here, uh, and then I have the link to the uh, full version of the report that, that's on the Wisconsin, the WHRP website. Thank you, Ray. Uh, Barry, you got any? Additional comments or closing comments? We'll no, I'll touch on them during my presentation. So, okay, why don't you take it over? All right. Stop sharing. All right. 
can you see my slides? Not yet. Yeah. Try it one more time. Here we go. Looks like it's coming on. Yep. There you go. We're good? Yep. Okay. So Ray did a really good job explaining how the research kind of uh, can give some in ways of looking at the way we work with our mixtures and how to improve durability. And what I really liked about his report is it justified some of the decisions we were making here at Wisconsin to try and improve the durability of our mixes, but also gave us an idea of some things we might want to look at in the future. Um, so I'm going to get into it real quick here because I know we've only got about 15 minutes left. But this table here that Ray had in the beginning of his report from the NCHRP study talks about all those things that affect durability. And again, the research project that he talked about was most focused on mixture comp composition properties. The reason I like this is this is a really good way of showing some of the things that we've done in Wisconsin to improve our specs. And I'll touch back to this at the back as to which areas we've kind of impacted with some of the recent specification changes we've made within the last three years. Uh, the big thing that we talked about within Ray's report here was the volumetric properties and how in-place air voids can affect things like permeability. Obviously, lower air voids would be lower permeability. But we got to be careful with that to not go so low in air voids that we lose our strength and our resistance to rutting. But one of the big concerns that Wisconsin, and I know many other states have been fighting lately, has been the resistance to cracking and the lack thereof. And uh, I think Ray did a really good job talking about how the effective volume of binder impacts that. And um, we've been working for a long time to really improve the VBE of our mixes. And I will talk a little bit about some of the changes we made there that have shown some improvement. Uh, we did increase our VMA uh, to 14.5 and our 12.5 millimeter low traffic level and medium traffic level mixes in 2015. So we did it before we had Ray's research, but what happened is Ray's research showed that increasing that VMA by a half percent is almost the same as changing your end mass by half a grade. So going making half of that change between a 19 to a 12 and a half. Or like we do in Wisconsin, we use a 12 and a half millimeter mix as our surface mix. But it gets us kind of half of the way there to increasing that VBE towards a nine and a half millimeter mix, which is a good durable mix. And this is a little different version of what Ray showed in his presentation, but it does show that making that change with that VBE from a 12.5 millimeter mix towards a 9.5 millimeter mix will improve our cracking resistance in our mix. So it kind of justified some of the decisions that we had made already, saying that we need to get more mix oil in our mix, and the flexibility index here shows that that is a good thing. A couple other things that we did that aren't exactly mix related, but to try and improve the durability is um, we had one of the lowest TSR ratios in the country. So for this year's construction season, we moved our TSR ratio from 70 to 75 if you're using an anti-strip to 75 or 80 if you're using an anti-strip to try and improve some of the durability of the stripping that Ray showed in one of his first slides. The hard part we fight is that we are still in a cold weather climate and we're still required to pave in a cold weather season. We try to avoid as much as possible, but in September and October when we're closing up jobs, it's just difficult to avoid sometimes. So we're starting to require warm mixed additive in those late season pavements to try and get that better compaction, better density, and therefore hopefully improve the durability of those pavements. Um, air void regression, though, I want to talk about this for a little bit. Uh, those of you that are, I don't think anybody from Michigan or any of our states have been on the call here, but this is nothing new to them. But for Wisconsin, it's a new spec change, and it's really, we're designing our mixes the same way we always have been. Target a 4% air void, produce your mix, find out what your optimum asphalt content is to get to that 4% air void. But what we do with air void regression is then once we have that target, we add nothing but virgin asphalt to get to a 3.0 air void on that curve, which goes 
to add 0.2 to 0.3 percent asphalt to a mix. And actually, in some of the mix designs we've seen recently, it's getting closer to 0.4 percent new asphalt being added to a mix. That's going to help a lot with that VBE, and I'll talk about that in a second. Also, increase, with that, we've increased our density targets in the field for compaction to 93 percent. We were running at 91.5 to 92 percent for our surface mixes. So with that FHWA study that Minnesota and Wisconsin and several other states participated in last year, showing that improved density will get you improved pavement life, the 1 to 1.5% 1 increase in density should get us at least 10%, if not more, increase in pavement life. When we combine that with adding more virgin AC to our mix, that's another life gain. So we're looking at really having some good 15 to maybe even 20% life improvements by these two specification changes that we've made last year. And we did put it in effect with our 2016 LET starting in December. Um, one other thing we're working on right now that's not complete yet is we're moving away from a running average system to track our mix during production to a percent within limit specification, which incentivizes staying as close to the target as possible. Uh, we've done, I believe, two projects last year, and we're going to do about 17 or 18 projects in Wisconsin this year with PWL specs that are really trying to incentivize us staying as close to the design targets as possible. And all of these should have more consistent and more quality improvements to our mix. So talking about that change that we had mentioned with the VBE, um, if you would go from 11 to 11 and a half, as Ray mentioned here, which would be that half percent VMA change, but you could also say that we're doing that by adding those three tenths to four tenths of a percent asphalt to the mix, we should see an increase of at least 0.7 with one of those changes. So I would say we would say receive an increase in that cracking flexibility index of greater than one with these spec changes. And that can go a long way to counter some of the effect that we're seeing of our recycled asphalt, that we can make up for maybe 10% of the recycled asphalt binder with some of these changes to try and get more virgin AC in. So increasing effective binder content, the ones that have bolded and underlined it here are the ones that we've taken or put into effect here in Wisconsin. So we've increased our design VMA. We've in decreased our design air voids. We haven't played with gyrations yet, and we're trying to move towards using 9.5 millimeter mixes more often, but we haven't gotten there yet. And then working with our SMAs, you know, using a polymer modified binder, highly effective binder content, and looking at durability mixtures. All of these things are things we're looking at to improve the durability of our mix. Ray showed this slide earlier that shows that moving from a virgin mix to a wrap or a wrap with RAS mix can have a negative effect in our cracking resistance. And that's pretty intuitive. This just puts numbers to what we've always felt was true based off of what we were seeing for performance. We're really trying to work on that cracking and we're really moving down the road to performance testing. We've partnered with Minnesota DOT and NCAT on quite a few studies that are going on at Min Road in uh, Auburn right now. In fact, half my staff's down at Auburn right now looking at Min Road, or excuse me, uh, NCAT test track. Um, but we're really embracing the Hamburg wheel. It's given us a different measure of how we are dealing with moisture susceptibility and rutting. The iFit, as Ray has talked about, um, we started down this research project using the Louisiana version of the SCB. The results weren't necessarily intuitive. They weren't matching up with what we thought we should see. So that's why we went to the modified procedure looking at the iFit analysis, which is really showing some trends that are meaningful and make sense. We're also looking at the uh, low temperature cracking with the DCT. So we've done a lot of projects. We've got several research projects looking at this. But the other part is to really truth out our asphalt content. Um, our old extraction method that used to wash the dust and the asphalt away could have been compromised by some of the dust content. So we're looking at just looking at the asphalt alone, and we're really doing that via the ignition oven. So I actually need to update all these photos because I've used other people's photos for these, but we now actually have all that equipment in our central lab. We do have the uh, 
InstroTech version of the uh, wheel tracker. We have our own DCT. We are set up to run iFit here at Wisconsin. And we have ignition ovens in all of our region labs, which is in Minnesota no big deal because you guys have been doing that for a while. But for us, it's our new way of verifying our asphalt content. We've done a lot of other research as well to try and improve durability and see what properties are really affecting our mix. We've got a study with NCAT to help us set up our specification for those ignition ovens and how do we do our calibrations and how do we make sure we set up a test that's repeatable. We are looking with UW-Madison at performance testing. They finished one study and they've got another one going, looking at where should we set our specs for our Hamburg wheels? Where should we set our specs for iFit? Where should we set our specs for DCT based off the materials that we have in Wisconsin? We just finished a joint density research project with Banky Materials. That study has had us, helped us produce a specification for longitudinal joint density that we're hoping to roll out this year so we can hopefully improve our longitudinal joint performance where we've seen some problems in some parts of the state. We've got two other projects that we're starting down the road of right now, one being moisture sensitivity. We do know that some of our aggregates in the northern part of the state are known strippers. They don't adhere to asphalt well. Um, what can we do to try and improve that moisture sensitivity and where should we set our specs on that? And then also looking at the balanced mix design. Is it just the volumetrics or the performance testing like we've been talking about with the iFit or the DCT or the uh, Hamburg wheel? How can we use that to really truly determine where our asphalt and air void should be set for a mix? And that's really the road that we're looking to get down here is knowing that there's a performance test component to all of this. And it's not just a numerical volumetric analysis that's going to tell us what's going to be a good performing mix. So we did make some big specification changes in 2016 to our asphalts. Believe it or not, we are specking a 6422 oil in Wisconsin for our overlays, going with the theory that it's going to crack, so why waste money on oil? Um, the 5828 is being for more of our new constructions and pavement replacements. Um, I know Minnesota made the move several years ago to using minus 34 oils throughout the state and saw a significant reduction in cracking and we're kind of hoping to go there as well. Looking at LTPP climatic data, we do have two different zones in Wisconsin. We'll have a northern asphalt zone that does experience colder temperatures and a southern zone that does see warmer temperatures. Um, truly, that cut line is probably further south than we have it drawn right now, but we did find some natural breaking points within the regions to try and set this back up. But I think this is something we may look at in the future as to where we define our northern paving zone and southern paving zone. So we've changed our specs that in the northern zone, the upper layers for new pavements are going to be a minus 34. Lower layers would be a minus 28. And in the southern zone, all the layers will be a minus 28. Now, as Ray has alluded to, if you put more recycle in, we may need to look at using those minus 34s in other areas. And those are specs that we have targeted for revision in the future. But what does that get us? Well, we used to do minus 22s. Moving to a minus 28 as our base grade helps us with that flexibility index. And then starting to use those minus 34s in those colder climates or with the recycled materials also has a very big impact on that flexibility index and that cracking. So those changes we made in binder grade, Ray is justified in this report by saying, yes, Wisconsin's moving the right way to try and reduce the amount of cracking. And this is a pretty good example that that move from a 58 from a 6422 to a 5828 basically can counter the effect of 20% recycled binder in our mixes. Where in the past we would put in 20% recycled binder in a 6422, we'd have a very stiff mix that was very susceptible to cracking. Well, making that move to a 28 can counter out quite a bit of that, so we should see a reduction in cracking with some of these spec changes we're making. It also points out that there's areas where we can move to improvement that if you make that move to a minus 34, you'll see a more significant reduction in cracking. And these are things that we need to keep in the back of our head as we set up our specifications as we want to work for recycled materials in the future in Wisconsin. He also mentioned the modification that we get a bump, move into that H grade or the V grade. 
and using that polymer modification. And we are starting to use those specifications for our higher traffic roads, where we'll use an H grade or a V grade on our interstates. Again, something else to help us resist that cracking. This isn't related to Ray's study, but it is something we're also trying to do to improve our compaction and therefore our durability is update our TAC codes. We pretty much had a loose TAC spec up to 2015. We didn't put enough down and we had problems. We saw a lot of pavements that looked like our pavement on the left here when we were paving. I know Minnesota has a sheet of black paper that references to what a TAC code should look like. And that's where we've had it as well, that we expect the pavements to look a lot more like the one on the right here. And we have seen benefits of it. We've seen better bonding. I haven't seen very many phone calls about slippage in the field as much as we had in the past. The bigger problem we have is now pickup and tracking, which means we've had some success with getting more tack down. We just have to fix that second part. So to kind of wrap this up here in our last minute, Everything that's bolded and underlined here are things that we've addressed related to durability within our specifications over the last several years, working with WAPA, working with industry, and working with the UW and our consultant partners to improve the temperature and the moisture effects in our mix. So look at weather conditions and make sure we're addressing them. So look at compaction to try and improve compaction and get better density and therefore more durability. Make sure we're getting a good bond between our layers. I have joints and italics because we've just started working on improving those specs. But also looking at our binder properties and making sure our volumetrics that we're getting enough oil in the mix that we're not starving it so it does want to resist cracking. And all these we're hoping should have some good improvements to what we're doing here in Wisconsin as to what we're working on for more improved durability in our asphalt mixtures. And what I really like about Ray's report is it's very easy for me to piggyback all these specification changes that we've made in Wisconsin and use his report as justification as to, yes, these decisions, besides being intuitive, do show numbers and statistics that back up that we should see improved performance. And with that, this is my contact information if you guys have any more questions. I know we're getting close to the end of the hour, so I'll turn it back over to you, Bob, if there's anything else you want to follow up with. Thank you, Barry. Thanks, Ray. Um, any questions online from any of the people that are online? For Barry or Ray, uh, we didn't have anybody have any questions. Okay. We have any questions in the room here? We got one here. So. Just looking at the model you came up with, I was concerned. Uh, that would be Ray. The model you came up with. Um, I know you were looking at flexibility index, but I mean, durability is the goal. Performance over time is the goal. Uh, there is nothing in your model that indicates moisture susceptibility, which is a very big factor in durability. Uh, are you looking in the future for a more global uh, phenomenological model that would include your moisture susceptibility? All the factors you highlight, very highlighted in that in a prediction model. Are you looking at that in the future? Because ideally, if you had started with a stepwise regression analysis, some of your uh, significant variables might even drop off if you include more significant variables. So uh, that's my question about that model. <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I guess. Uh... You know, maybe, maybe I have to, to kind of put this in, in context. Um, the moisture sensitivity is not something that we looked at, okay? And, and, and keep in mind that those flexibility indices really were not, at least in the work that we did, were not related to field performance. They were related uh, just uh, to the idea that, that the load-associated cracking resistance uh, would improve with improvements in the flexibility index. So I agree with you that there, there can be many things uh, within a, a model of that type that affect performance and durability. Uh, in our case, we were doing this under the assumption that we were not dealing with moisture-sensitive mixtures, that that was not the issue that we were chasing after. 
So, uh, you know, moisture sensitivity isn't in there. And, you know, I can tell you that there, there is not work uh, ongoing to try to incorporate moisture sensitivity into that. Uh, it, it really was to, to develop a model to explain uh, the effects of those factors that we found in the, the literature review uh, and, and the effect of those factors on the potential for cracking as measured by the flexibility index. So it's not an all-encompassing model. Yeah, and we did not ask Ray to look at moisture sensitivity in that one. We actually have broken out a separate WHRP study that is going to look at that for us that we are currently undergoing right now where we're actually going to look at different types of aggregates with and without anti-strip and really getting a better idea of where our specs need to be on that one. But it is a critical factor, I would say, in how our pavements are before performing. So your, your question is valid. we got one more question. I think we'll wrap it up. Uh, this is a question for Ray, too. <clears throat> Ray, for the HCB test, how many rap records do you, did you do? And if you did multiple rap records, what's the results of variability did you see? Oh, the, the replicates, uh, <clears throat> what was done for, for each of those cells, uh, a, a single uh, flexibility index value in those cells was the average of three tests. Okay, so there, there would be three flexibility index tests were done. Uh, I would say that, that if all of the uh, variability information is included in the report, but if, if my memory serves correctly, I think that a, a typical uh, coefficient of variation for the flexibility index would have been probably around 20 percent, uh, where we saw values that probably ranged from as low as about 10 percent up to probably somewhere around 30 percent. Uh, so, you know, the, there is variability associated with that test. Um, I think the way that we applied it uh, takes a lot of that variability away. Uh, I would not be comfortable yet in, in applying that test, let's say, as a, uh, a specification requirement uh, and an acceptance requirement because more work on the variability needs to be done. But our, our goal was to look at the general trends that we saw uh, as a function of the, you know, the, the general trends that we saw as we changed uh, the factors in the experiment. And I think there uh, we're, we're getting a fair average value of, of what those changes would be. All right. Thank you, Ray. Thank you, Barry. Uh, You're welcome. We'll wrap up our presentation for today. Very good presentation. Just uh, one more reminder for the conference next week. And then our next research pays off, I believe, is scheduled for June 20th. No, I'm not quite sure yet what the subject is, but we'll post that on our website. So with that, we'll let everybody go. Thank you.